Hello, welcome to the Service Nerd channel, where today we're going to play with ServiceNow Script Debugger. Oh, it's exciting stuff. But before we get started, if you're new here, don't forget to hit subscribe. And if you tap the bell icon, you'll get notified when I post new videos just like this one. Now, in this session, we're going to focus on server-side debugging. So within ServiceNow, we have multiple tools in our belt to find those pesky bugs within our code. Hang on, not our code. It's usually someone else's code, let's be honest, because we never write bad code, do we? No. Um, and one of those tools that we can use is Script Debugger, which I know it's been around for a while. I believe it was born in Istanbul, um, but don't quote me on that. If someone knows, um, if they drop something in the comments below, let everyone else know, but I believe it was in Istanbul. Um, oh, before I get started, um, everything we do today is on the Paris version. That's right. I took the plunge and I upgraded. I haven't had a proper look around yet, and so if anyone's found any cool features that's worth a review, drop a note in the comments below and I'll pick those up. Right, where were we? Yeah, enough waffle. Um, debugging. So we all have those times where we're working on some code and need to test or debug it as we're going along. Some, some new features that we're doing that we need to de debug. Or perhaps we're working on an incident or a defect that's come in and we need to look at it and find out what the root cause is. So there are various things to help us. Um, briefly, let's touch on though, we, we've got, of course, one of the first go-to places is the sys log itself. So we have logs. And we can go in there and we can see various things that are going on with the system. What else do we have? We have debug logs. We have debug business rules. So if we type debug here, we have all of these things to play with. Not all of them are relevant for server side, so we won't cover them all. In fact, we're not really going to cover any today of those. Um, so we have those. And of course, we have my personal favorite, which is adding statements into the script itself. Uh, and what I mean by that is, it, let's just jump into script incident. What's that? Script include. We mean something like, let's just pick rate line, whatever that is. Um, we mean bits or, or lines within the code where we can write things like GS info. And who does this? Here, one. And then as we go down through the function, we might write, uh, let's just put them in, we're not gonna run this, but we might write here two, here three. Um, I have to be honest, I'm guilty of doing something like this. So when you're looking at the, the when you these functions run and you're looking at this in the logs, you start seeing here one, here two, here three. So you can see at what point in the function um, the code is breaking. Um, we also have things like GS print, GS log, GS info, GS warn, GS error, GS debug, blah, de blah, de blah. Um, but the point is we put um, different statements inside the code. And of course, we all know that we can say, in this case, um, fields. So within the, the log itself, it would output here three plus fields, whatever the value is of that variable. So I hope, I'm hoping everyone's with me at this point. Um, and I'm not just on my own with putting those statements in. Um, but what I want to show you today is the script debugger, because I think it's quite exciting um, and it can potentially help out um, and, and make our lives a lot simpler. And also the one thing I do want to point out is that when we put in these logs here, GS info or debug messages, GS debug, we need to remove those before we go into a live environment. Um, it is not good practice to keep debug statements that are constantly running in the live environment. So we need to uh, remove them. In doing so, what we start doing is we create another version of the script include. Um, and so one of the side effects of, of constantly putting um, logging statements in our, in our functions there and saving is we end up with multiple versions, 10, 20, 30 different versions of the script include. Um, and I know from my personal point of view, going back a few years ago, it gets to the point where you have lots of versions of a business rule or a script include, and it starts to look a bit embarrassing because you'll look at other script includes and there'll be like two or three versions. And then the one that you're working on has got like 30 different versions. Um, and that's because you've 
been debugging it constantly. Um, so if anyone else has, has, has been through that as well, or maybe it's just me, um, drop something in the comments as well. Um, however, again, I'm waffling. Let's go to the script debugger. So for the purpose of this, what we're going to do is we're going to create an incident. Let's leave that. We don't need to save that. We're going to create an incident. And what's going to happen is I'm going to select Able. And when I create or update um, this incident, all it's going to do is it's going to go to the request item table. It's going to search for all the open rhythms that Able's got, and it's going to return a info message at the top. Oh, info message. That's another debugging uh, methodology I've seen people use is write um, info messages along the top. You'll see it in a second. Um, but all it's going to do is come back with all the rhythms and say, Able, that these are your rhythms. Or the agent that's locking the incident, I suppose, could could um, know what rhythms they've got. Um, why have I done that? What's the point in that? Well, it's just really to show you this um, this debugging, how that works. Um, probably something you wouldn't do in live because you'd want to know on change of the caller rather than on save of the record. But either way, let's see what it does. Okay, and there we go. There's our um, GS info messages. Um, so let's go over to the business rule and take a look at what it's actually doing and then start debugging it. So on the business rule, which is again, update and insert the incident, we go through the rhythms. We look for those rhythms that are assigned to Able. And then while we find one, we create a little mini object. Um, I say mini object, it's just got two attributes within it. Um, we create a, an object for each. So we put in the number and what's the cat item associated to it. And then we push that object into an array. So by here, we've got an array of objects. And then we cycle through those down here. We cycle through, through the array and we pull out the number and the item and we output those on the screen. So in terms of this code, there's not actually anything wrong with it. It's functionally running um, and working as we'd expect. But I need to show you the debugger. So we're going to add in what we call some breakpoints. Now breakpoints are effectively points or, or yeah, points that we can put in the code that we can then pause the code at those breakpoints. So then we can interrogate things like variables. What are the variables um, values of those variables assigned at a particular point in time? And they become very, very useful. So how do we do that? So if we go over to the numbers, the lima numbers, we're going to see a little blue ribbon. Um, you've probably added breakpoints before um, by accident in the past, because I know I have. So what we can do is we can add in some breakpoints. And we do that by left clicking. Or we could go down to here and we can right click and then add a breakpoint. Now we don't need to save, that's an important thing. We don't need to save and, and create another version of our code, but we do need to click this little green bug here. And what that does is that opens up the script debugger. And that'll load, let's just remove the script include, that's something I was playing with earlier. Um, that'll load the business rule script, debug test, and it'll put in our breakpoints for us. So then what we need to do is we go back to our incident. Now what you can't see on, on my other screen, I've got a notification that pops up that says service now debugger has been paused. And you'll get that on your screen as well. And what it does, if we now head over to the session debugger, you notice that this is different. We've now, this is red. Okay, and we've got a lot more information. So we've got, it's, it's taken us to the call stack. So this shows us the call stack of that record in terms of, I guess, which sequence this was executed. We've also got the status at the bottom there, execution paused. Okay. So then this is where it starts getting really clever and, and helpful for us. So if we look on the right hand side, we can see the local variables. So current, we all know in business rules, we've got access to current and previous. I is undefined. Well, what's I? Ah, right. Well, down here in my for loop on line 22, I declare I. And at that point on line four, I haven't declared I for anything. I haven't given I a value. Written here is undefined. Why is that? Because we've, we've got no written defined. It's just, uh, it's on line four, we're starting the query. Written array. So we have declared that on line two, and it's telling us it's the type of array. Written object, undefined again. 
what we can do then so we, we can see ah right that at that point in the in the code this is the value of these arrays so what we can then do is you've got the pause function up there but you've also got the play so resume so we can do that and it's important to know this this script debugger will only be running for you so the person that's put in the breakpoints it won't be holding script up um, for anyone else so don't worry about that but now what I've done is I've resumed and it's taken us you saw it move down to this next uh, breakpoint line 19 and that'll tell us I is still undefined because it is but now Whereas before we had the written array was just a type of array, we've now got array. So what we can do is click on this and we can start seeing, well, how many objects? This has got six, six objects. So if we look at one, let's look at the first one. In there, we can see item number, um, item is BMW 3 Series, that's the number. As we go down, we can start seeing all the different attributes within it. So that becomes very useful. That allows us to see what's going on at that point in time. So that could let, allow us to see the last object that was input, which I'm guessing was is number five. It is, yeah. So that is still declared there. Now, in order to, to continue this, we just click continue. And then if we whiz back over here, we now have our um, DS info messages. Yeah, how useful was that? So that allows us, okay, I realize in this case, it's not a huge amount of code and to be honest, you can pretty much guess and see what's going on. However, it allows us to see the variables and how they change throughout the function, which is very, very useful. There's some other features as well um, on the top right, so you can skip over a breakpoint if you want to, but I'm not going to get that in today, um, in, on this video today. I just want to show you this, how easy it is to use and how, um, if I'm being honest, how excited I was uh, when I found it and started using it. And it, it's really cut my debugging time down um, um, and also my understanding of, of what's happening within functions. There is one other thing I, I want to show you before we close off for today. And I find this very, very useful. So what we could also do, and for those of us who love our GS log and GS infos and still can't get away from them, what you can do is if... I don't know, where should we put one? Let's put it here. If on line 20, we right click and we put a conditional breakpoint, and this again, we can put um, conditions in this breakpoint, say, you know, if, if this variable equals um, X, then run this breakpoint, if not, you know, skip over it. However, what we can do is we can put in our lovely GS info message. This is a test. Okay, and again, we don't need to save here. It's going to be yellow. We, we don't need to save. So then when we come back, and we go to our debugger, then go to logs. We now have this is a test so how great was that so we can still if we're still emotionally attached to our GS logs like in fairness I am sometimes we can still add in a GS info message yeah so we can still do that and the key to that is we don't need to save and why is that really good well if we're working on something in the live environment I wouldn't suggest you do this by the way but if we were, and we can only replicate it in live, and we need to do some some debugging on a business rule um, script include, any server-side script really, we can simply put that in. And that info message will only be session-based, so it's only based on our session, and it won't save it to the record either. Um, so we won't be, be filling up the logs every time this runs, it's only when we run it in the session. Um, and we don't need to save it so we're not doing any technically we're not doing any changes to the live environment one thing i would say is just remember to remove the breakpoints okay okay now is there any points to note on this um 
yes, there is a, a, a couple of points to note. So I mentioned before around sessions, I've mentioned that a couple of times. So we need to be aware of the session. So the script debugger, it can pull any server side script that runs in an interactive transaction like a business rule, a script includes script actions or UI actions that require a response or something. Um, but only if the session is interactive. So it'll run, so what that means is, is I guess it'll work for synchronous code that can be debugged. If we've got, excuse me, if we've got a Glide Ajax, which is asynchronous, and, and if you don't know much about that, I've done another video based on Glide Ajax and, uh, and async methods. Um, and we should always try and do async when it comes to Glide Ajax, rather than waiting for the service to, co to come back. So where we've got an async method, um, it won't work because it's it's a different session. So what I'm saying is it runs part of the current transaction. So we just need to be aware of that, okay? The other thing to be aware of, will it run for scheduled jobs? No, it won't. Again, because the person that starts the scheduled job isn't necessarily the person that's making the transaction, in which case it's it's a, a background system transaction. So we just need to be aware of those things. Again, if you want any more clarity on that, um, I'm gonna drop some some uh, URLs or some some links out to the descriptions around script debugger and you can go in and have a play yourself um, But also put some comments in as well And if, if I can't help you out then hope that someone else on the comments might be able to help you out also Okay, that's it for today. Hope you've enjoyed it If there's anything you want me to expand on or different topics you want me to cover in future Please add something to the comments below and oh, there was something else. Oh, yeah subscribe